to the Okta Workforce Identity Developer Podcast. Today, I'm pleased to welcome back developer advocate Alisa Duncan, and welcome to the show SDK engineer Jared Peralt. Hi there, Alisa and Jared. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for being here. We've previously spoken on this podcast with SDK engineer Laura Rodriguez, so returning listeners will be a little bit acquainted with Okta's SDK work, but Jared brings us a different perspective on it. So Jared, what does the SDK engineer role look like for you? My job is to write SDKs that conform to the OAuth spec and specifically implement Okta. Obviously, Okta is an OAuth offering, and so there's you know certain implementation details that Okta has chosen to implement and such. Um, and I think one perspective that I'll have that's a little bit different than Laura is that she is a backend SDK uh, author, and I work on predominantly front-end SDKs focusing on uh, JavaScript. One thing that you called it when we were talking about your role before was a career of reading docs that other people didn't want to read. So you're really doing that interpretation, aren't you? The the docs, the specs specifically can be a little bit dry, but you know, it's just part of the gig. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're mostly on that Okta Auth JS. Who is that for? Who should use Okta Auth JS? Okta Auth JS is um Basically, for any JavaScript needs, uh, can reach for that SDK. Uh, it's made to to execute in browsers, in Node.js environments. I believe there are some people that even use it in like Electron apps and other things. It is quite mon monolithic. We do kind of plan to break it up a little bit into smaller chunks. Uh, it's kind of like the work that we're we're looking on in the horizon. But uh, right now, it's for any JS application. Yeah, right now it's your one-stop shop for uh, bringing OAuth compatibility to your JavaScript. So this SDK work is all about making it easy for people to use OAuth and to do OAuth right. Um, how would you describe the relationship between that spec and the SDKs that you work on? The SDK is kind of trying to position itself to do all of the work uh, for you in the areas that we can. So if you're implementing OAuth, with a a user, so it's a browser application. You have to, you might have to do right, write things like Pixie to storage, and you know, uh, run some, you know, uh, cryptographic algorithms for various things. Um, so we try and handle all that kind of stuff for you, so you can store tokens, and all you have to worry about is integrating the SDK into your app, and then you know everything else is already done for you as as much as we can possibly do. When you look at the spec. You see, there's not that much about clients compared to servers and the general protocol. Um, what's up with that? I don't know. I think that in a lot of ways that the spec is written for like zero trust clients. I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit, mm -hmm. but I think that uh, the spec is kind of written to be suspicious of clients on on purpose, right? You have to pre you have to authenticate, you know, on, prove who you are. Um, so I, th I think that's, you know, kind of the, kind of the reason why there isn't a lot of detail about it, where a server is presumably a known entity. So you have already have like a trust relationship with your, with your own servers. I would hope anyway. We hear a lot about zero trust. Would you like to define how you use that term here? The, the way that I think about it, because the way that OAuth is kind of positioned is everything is kind of from the perspective of the, of the authorization server. And I think that was something that took me a little bit of time to get my head around because I always think of everything from the perspective of a user, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm given a ticket that says user needs to log into this application. So I'm thinking like, all right, they enter a username, they enter a password, you know, well, what do I do with the user and password? And then, you know, you look at the spec and it, and it doesn't say like, oh, give the username, give the password. Um, so the way I kind of think about it is that the authorization server has no reason to trust the, the client that is saying, I I am Jared Peralt, um, where if you're integrating uh, OAuth from a server, you have a little bit, you trust the, the, the computer, the server that is then making that request. So it's a little bit more reliable to it. The auth authorization server can trust that you are who you say you are, where a browser could be anyone, anywhere, anytime. So uh, there's there's not a lot of um, pre-built trust before you're identifying yourself. 
You're saying that zero trust means that one, you always have to make sure that the person or that caller is who they say they are and they have the access to whatever resources that they are requesting. And that maybe we shouldn't trust browsers. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, essentially, uh, you know, uh, anyone, Fair anyone, enough. Can, anyone can go to any website, you know, and type in credentials and, you know, see what happens. So, you, you know, yeah, you have to do a little bit of due diligence and obviously, you know, there's, there's a whole internet in between, you know, the browser and the computer. So, you know, there are many attack vectors and such that can be done there. Um, you know, these payloads are going over an open internet, you know, so you have to make sure that everything is, is, you know, encrypted and secured and, you know, in transit and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, definitely. And so is zero trust the only way that we can do authentication or are there other tools for situations where it might only be partially applicable? No, so it all depends on where you want to actually interact with the authorization server. Okay, that's kind of why I'm saying I try and think about it from the perspective of the authorization authorization server. Uh, so if you want to implement OAuth directly in your, your web application, like on the browser, um, then that would be considered a zero trust client. But if you want to have your uh, web server establish like a more traditional like session between the the web app and your server you could then implement oauth on your server so the session basically represents some kind of ui uuid or whatever to then access the tokens and then those tokens can be used to be sent to resource servers or whatever you're protecting obviously then you have to do things like manage state because sessions are you know based in state and all those kinds of things so obviously it's always more convenient to do you know like I don't want to say less security, but you know, the less the less moving parts you have, the simpler your application is, and somewhat obviously. So yeah. it is of, often more convenient to implement OAuth on the browser directly, but it is theoretically less secure because yeah, the the reasons we've stated. When we start talking about using SDKs, I think of them kind of like being trails through a park. So following a trail gives you fewer choices than just like taking off into the underbrush and hiking across the stream instead of going over to the bridge and just getting straight to where you're going. But the trails are put in places where people would probably prefer to walk. And often you still come to this fork in the trail and have to choose which one you're going to take. And one of those might take you quickly where you're going. Another one might take longer or might not even go where you want to. So in that metaphor, where are the big decision points when someone starts using the AuthJS SDK, where they'll have to basically choose their own adventure for how they want to use it? I think it's probably just like right at the beginning, if I'm being honest. Like mm -hmm. as I was saying, I think if you're if you're comfortable with implementing OAuth on the client, then you know you would reach for the SDK methods that are designed to be run in a browser. It is ultimately a uh, isomorphic module, which means it will run, you know, in in a browser or in node like on a server but there are certain methods that are only going to uh, execute in in a specific environment if you prefer to do something where you have a more traditional session established between the client and your server and your server implements oauth then uh you know you'll you'll reach for those those specific methods uh for the most part once you kind of choose a path I, I think you know it's it's kind of like you know there's not a lot of forks on the paths themselves but i think you know it's it's kind of like, uh, I, I guess, to extend your metaphor, more like a ski, like a ski slope. You know, you're choosing what mm -hmm. ski slope to go down, and once you're on the ski slope, you're not going to suddenly, you know, jump to another one. I mean, I hope you wouldn't anyway. So one of the early things that someone who's setting up the SDK may encounter is the choice of app type. So what should a developer know in order to pick the correct application type for their use case? The two main app types that that we really deal with would be either spa single page app or a web app. So a web app means that the relationship to the auth server is on your server. It's a, it's a trusted com uh, computer. Um, and then the advantage to that is that you can use a client secret. Um, this kind of goes back to the, the zero trust uh, conversation that when you have a zero trust client, you don't want to provide that client a client secret. This client secret is supposed to be, you know, a secret. Uh, 
So if you were to put that into source code that would be distributed on a browser, people could easily look that up, you know, examine the source, uh, the payloads that you're sending back and forth and like the JavaScript debugger. Um, so that secret would no longer be a secret. Um, so if you choose, if you want to implement OAuth on the client in a browser, you would uh, choose the, the SPA option for your app type. Yeah, the SPA's, uh, it's taken me a while to always do reference that as a single page app. We're not just sending it off for some relaxation. We're actually trusting it less. Um, how big of a problem is it if you guess wrong about what app type you're going to use? And how would you go about fixing that? Uh, it, it's not a big problem at all. You could just very simply create another app and then you just update your auth.js config with the new client ID and or client secret, depending on which way you're you're okay. um, going. So when you say create a new app, you mean set up another integration in Okta? Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about how that part of the process works in a few minutes. So what you want to make sure is that if you are running JavaScript within your own within your own user, right? Or your own machine. So you're having a spot, you have a spa, you have a view app, you have Angular, you have React, whatever. And everything is basically public, right? With the JavaScript application. That's when you want to make sure that you don't have any secrets in it. It's called a public client versus if you have something like a, uh, let's say a .NET MVC application or something in like Java Spring, where it is all um, running within the context of the server, you can then store client secrets there and it would be considered confidential. So that's what the way I think about it. If I'm, if I'm writing something that is completely public or is there a way that I can keep a secret from somebody else, right? To piggyback off of that, you can still use like Angular view like a, a traditional spa framework as a spa, but still protect it from from the server, so that would be establishing a session, as I was mm -hmm. saying, and then um, having the the server itself then um, inter interface with the authorization server. There there's a few inconveniences to that because one of the things you'll get from the authorization server is an ID token, which often uh, represents the user's profile information. So you can say you know like you know hi Jared and all that kind of stuff. But you can solve that very easily by just adding an endpoint to your server that your web app would hit um, up, upon a successful authentication. The next thing, once you've decided whether your app is going to be handling secrets or whether it's going to be a public app, is that you're going to start thinking about the flows that you're building. So if this is someone's first exposure to the idea of flows in the OAuth context, how would you describe what flow even means? Yeah, I think this is something that kind of took me a little while to get my head around as well. So I I, I kind of try to think about it from the perspective of the auth server. So the auth, the auth server is ultimately the, you know, the source of truth to, you know, whether or not it, you have proven you are who you, who you say you are. Um, so it, it kind of describes how the flow of data to the auth server and then back to the requester um, like flows flows through the system. So you know all of the components in, in the in the system. So if it's a browser, it would be a browser. If it's server, server. I mean if it's a if it's a browser, presumably you're you're interfacing with your server as well at times. Um, so it kind of just describes the the transfer of uh, information uh, to the various, you know, actors in the in the system. Yeah, I like to think about flows from um, like I guess the user perspective. So maybe the opposite of the uh, auth server. I think of it as a use case. If I think about how I want to um, authenticate into a system, am I doing it as a user on a web browser? Am I doing it as a user, you know, was it using an using a spa application? Am I doing it as a user from a different sort of web server at PHP ad perhaps, or am I doing something else like in the command line or you know whatever it is, so I'm thinking of it that way and then saying, okay, so now I have these associated OAuth flows that goes with that use case. So what are the most common flows that you see people using in the SDK? Uh, for the, the client, it's gonna be authorization code with Pixie. Um, that's, that's by far the most common one. 
I think we do technically support authorization code without Pixie, but we absolutely do not recommend that. Pixie is essentially a mechanism to compensate for the lack of the client secret um, so that the auth server has some proof that the original requester is the one that is fulfilling the request. Essentially, if you don't have Pixie, you're sending a you're being sent back a code and that code can be exchanged for tokens by anyone that has that code. It wouldn't be so good if, uh, yeah. you know, someone, there's a whole internet between you mm -hmm. and, you know, you and your server, your users and your servers. Yeah. When I was checking the docs for what flows we were likely to end up talking about, I noticed that in the pure auth code, no pixie flow, it said, just set the response type to code and pixie to false in the auth.js config. And I went, uh-oh, um, that looks pretty deprecated. Yeah, absolutely. And so in the pixie flow, which is spelled P-K-C-E and stands for proof key for code exchange. Um, that's what we recommend for the single page apps that can't store secrets. So what actually is Pixie? So what it what it is, is it's a cryptographically generated string. So you have your Pixie verif your code challenge, and then your code, uh, your code verifier. And at different points in the flow, you'll send the challenge and then the verifier to your auth server. So um, you'll send your your challenge first, and then the auth server, assuming you're successfully authenticated, will send back a an authorization code, and then you exchange that authorization code and your code verifier to the token endpoint, which will then return tokens, assuming that your code challenge and your code verifier match. Yeah, when I looked into the docs, um, I got about as far as we make a random string and then we use a hash of the random string. And because you, I think, kept your random string secret, then by being able to hash it and hash it with things, you can prove that you're the same person who originally generated that random string. So you keep someone else from jumping in partway through the um, conversation that you're having with the server and going, oh, well, yes, I'm totally the same person as before. They go, oh, you don't have the right hashes. You don't have the same secret as before. Let's bail out here. Yeah, exactly. And then that would be an example of something that the SDK would do for you. So anytime you would make a request with uh, with an SDK method, we we generate all of the uh, the Pixie, the, the code challenge, the verifier. We write it to local storage so it can be retrieved later. Um, you know, all the all the things that you would have to do to implement that flow yourself. That's an example of something we can do for you. Yeah, well, we talked about using uh, Pixie in this context with a spa, but Pixie uh, should be used for any time you use authorization code flow, including for confidential clients as well, because it's it's just so awesome. I like to think of it as like it is Pixie powered, like powered by woodland creatures sort of thing. And so I, I'm a fan. Yeah, it's such a relatively small thing that you can do for such huge security gains. That why wouldn't you enable it? Um, another flow that you see written about quite a lot, although it is deprecated, is the implicit flow. So I thought it might be worth asking, uh, what did the implicit flow used to do back in the day? So the implicit flow can still be used today, but it's not recommended for SPA applications. Um, the reason is that the way that it returns tokens to the requester is it does so through a redirect that includes the tokens in the URL as a query parameter. So your tokens are essentially just out in the open for anyone that can see the URL. And that's possibly the most fundamental part of the internet protocol is URLs. So um, it's the reason it's not recommended anymore for spot applications is that um, I think you can still theoretically use it for more traditional web apps that are going to do like a true browser HTTP post, because then the tokens would be returned in the post body rather than as a query parameter. Um, but that doesn't really um, interface with spa apps very well. That's more of like a traditional web app um, sort of approach. So you can still use implicit flow in some cases, but um, definitely not recommended for spa. And how urgent would you say that it is for somebody to switch off of implicit flow if they had ended up with it on a spa app? Yeah, I would say take care of that sooner rather than later for sure. 
Yeah. yeah. It's the, Agreed. It sounds like anybody watching your web traffic is just getting all your tokens and you're hoping that they don't decide to impersonate you. I also want to uh, add that there's some really great um, YouTube videos and blog content about the implicit flow and why also to switch over to like come to that some of the more deeper context on that. I highly recommend it. It's great stuff. And are there any other flows supported in AuthJS that someone might see in the docs and be like, oh, should I, should I care about that? Is this for me? Um, I noticed that there was an interaction code flow. Like, would that ever beat auth code um, Pixie? So interaction and uh, interaction code flow is actually a extension of the OAuth spec that was written by Okta, and it's heavily based on authorization code flow. Um, so it it uses Pixie as well, um, but it's 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 made more for a better like user experience. I guess is the way I would phrase it. Mm -hmm. It, you kind of interact with the authorization server in multiple uh, interactions um, rather than collecting all the data from your user, like, you know, one form username, password, hit, you know, hit submit. Um, you can, you know, first collect their identifiers, return that to the server, ask for the password, you return that to the server. They, may, they now ask for a secondary factor. Um, you know, it may return to the user all of the factors that they have already set up so they could choose to, you know, authorize with email, SMS, um, whatever. It all depends on how you set up your Okta org, but it's a much more uh, dynamic. Um, I don't want to call it, I mean, it is an API, but it's not truly a REST API. So I don't, I don't, I <laughs> usually when people say API, they're talking about REST mm -hmm. APIs and it's, it's not quite that. Um, it's all it's all post responses, uh, but the the way you would use that if you wanted to is is the easiest way is to use the IDX client that AuthJS offers, um, and the the end result is essentially the same. In an authorization code flow, you'd get an auth code authorization code back, um, interaction code you get an interaction code back, but those codes can be both exchanged to the token endpoint in the same manner, and they're both protected by Pixie as well. So. Um, for the most part, when you're implementing either one of these flows, they're they're mostly the same uh, as far as how they interface with your application. So that's what's under the hood when I get this really elegant like behavior shift to using the right local verifier if I'm on my phone versus on my laptop kind of thing. The web page and the identity server are just trading that extra little bit of information that wasn't mandatory per OAuth, but makes things run a bit smoother. Yeah, it's kind of like an extension to OAuth for humans, where OAuth mm -hmm. is a little bit more for like machine to machine communication. So, thinking about uh, having that better user experience, then let's talk about authentication user experience, right? <laughs> because that's like a big thing. People want to have highly customized pages, but there's a lot of advantages of redirecting to an identity provider and then have had having a uh, them, whether it's Okta, whoever handle that for you. Uh, what are the options and why would you pick one or the other over the other? I would always uh, choose, as we call it, redirect model, which is you redirect to Okta and Okta collects all the credentials um, from your user. And then we uh, redirect back to your application. The main reason is that then your, your, the user's credentials only can are uh, only ex ever exist in an Okta system, where if you implement the IDX uh, SDK yourself or um, some other auth flow, the credentials at some point will be in your in your system, whether it be on your you know the the browser, whether it be on your server, however you're implementing OAuth. Um, and then you, you know, you'll have to be responsible for the fact that, you know, passwords and things could be traveling through your system. Um, the other advantage is that, you know, at uh, the redirect model, the, all the Octa sign in widget and such, it's always patched. It's always up to date. You don't have to worry about maintaining any of those types of things. And it's honestly just a lot simpler to implement. Uh, we have things like the, you know, the Octa sign in widget that is, you know, a, a pre-assembled UI with any authenticator you could possibly imagine. We already have views and you know all those things for it. Um, so, and if you were building an auth experience from scratch, um, you know that would be a, a pretty heavy investment um, compared to taking one that right off the shelf. 
Yeah, another yeah. perk to using redirect auth is that people's hardware tokens can work on the correct URL. Uh, like we talked about in a prior podcast with Mega Restogi, if you do try to do embedded auth, some um, tokens just plain won't hand out your creds if you're not the domain that they issued those creds for. Yeah, there's been a crackdown in uh, third-party cookie for browsers. I, I, I believe the motivation is to try and prevent... Um, like like ads from you know spying on all the websites and things you're visiting, but uh, unfortunately, it does break some existing uh, OAuth flows as well. What excuses do people use to keep the embedded auth when we when redirect is so much more secure? You get a lot more control, so you can customize the views and such a lot better. I mean, obviously, if you're gonna if you're gonna write the view yourself, right, you can make it uh, look however you want to. Um, where if you're using uh, the redirect model, you're using the the OctaSign in widget, there is um, a, a theming API and things that you can use to make it look, you know, closer to your brand colors or what have you. But, um, you know, there's obviously going to be limitations to how, how much it can look like, you know, your existing web app, where if you were to build it yourself, you can control it a lot better. And that can sometimes be a little bit of user education going a long way as well with understanding that talking directly to an identity provider is better than giving your creds to whatever website asks for them. Personally, I would be a little bit suspicious if I'm on a website and, you know, it's like black and purple and then I, you know, get redirected to a page that's suddenly white and blue, you know, so I, I do think in a lot of cases theming um, is is important because uh, it's very jarring when suddenly, you know, the, the page is completely different. So uh, I I, I would say that, that that is an advantage, but yeah, the keeping the credentials in in, in only Okta, I think is probably a, a, a better argument for a redirect model. But with the brand's API, you really can have it both ways. You can also add the uh, custom domain for your, for that redirect to Okta. So it can look like a seamless experience still within your own. Uh, domain name. So that's also pretty helpful. And I feel like it's the days of just using a username password field as your only two authentication fields are over, right? So yeah. the amount of work that it takes to integrate the higher elevated security levels that we need now, it's it's way beyond just a simple username password. If we're using AuthJS to talk to an Okta tenant, the docs will walk us through using the Okta admin console to set up what we call an Okta application. And I've noticed that that term application is really overloaded, but the way that I like to think about it is that the app that you create is kind of sort of like making a user account for the integration, but it's not a user account for a person. It's an account where permissions management is done in a way that makes sense for a machine talking to a machine instead. Um, do you have any tips for making the right choices when you set that up? Yeah, so I think we kind of touched about mm -hmm. it a, a little bit earlier. Um, if you do choose to implement OAuth on the browser directly, then you'll want to choose SPA application as your app type. But if you want to implement OAuth on your server, then you would choose web app. Um, web app is going to be slightly more secure because you'll get the advantage of using a client secret. Um, but in some cases can be a little bit um, less convenient than having the tokens directly on the client. And then, yeah, you'll have to select which grant type you want, and that will uh, correspond to what auth flow that you're trying to implement. Um, maybe I'm a little biased, but I, I don't think it's all that hard to set up. Uh, like my first week at Okta, I, I had an app up and running in like a few hours. Um, so it's 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 a... Like I was saying, like this, going back to the ski slope example, I, once you kind of get started, you know, you, you're you're going to reach the bottom of the mountain one way or the other. I've definitely found that whenever anything goes wrong setting up an app, it's because I skipped the step following the directions. When you do each step in order, it works great. But you do have to make sure that you match between what your code is configuring to try to ask Okta for and what Okta is told, this is what I should give to this client, because any mismatch there could represent someone um, attacking you, trying to misuse your creds. And then we've also got a lot of framework-specific SDKs for various JavaScript frameworks. Do you have thoughts on when a dev should choose the framework-specific SDK or just use pure AuthJS? 
The way I would describe the the framework SDKs is they're a little bit of a opinionated uh, implementation of, I guess, I guess auth JS. Um, so the they're they're set up to heavily favor redirect model, and oh, I think all the samples and and, and such even sh only really illustrate using the redirect model. If you want a more customizable experience, you may just want to use AuthJS uh, yourself. Ultimately, these framework SDKs wrap AuthJS, so um, you'll still have your AuthJS instance uh, available to you uh, through the, the the framework SDK that you're using. Um, so you can still reach for AuthJS methods when when you need to. Yeah, if you're just trying to get something uh, built very quickly using the framework SDK to, with a redirect model is uh, the fastest and easiest way to do it. So you were talking a lot about uh, spas here in this example, but what about other sorts of JavaScript-based applications? So it's like maybe just Node, um, let's say you have an Express API, or if you have, um, if you're writing a web app in Express, you know, using mm -hmm. like a templating engine, like what are, are there options there as well? Yeah, so I, that really goes back to where you actually want to implement OAuth. So you can have a Express server serve, um, you know, serve a React app. But if you are protecting a resource server that's independent of that Express app, maybe you want the clients on the server so the client can reach directly to the Express app. Maybe you want to have your Express app kind of exist as like a a middleman proxy so that you know your backend resources are, are never accessed directly from a browser they go through your express app as like an intermediary so in that case it might make more sense to have your tokens uh your, your oauth in, in, integration on the uh on the server in the express app itself so you in that case you might just establish a very uh traditional session between the express app and your react app and your react app at that point wouldn't need any octa sdk it would just be uh, the, the session as as everyone knows it today um you would use auth.js on your within the express app however to to interface with uh with okta to actually get your tokens um on the server side where would one use like the jwt verifier um sdk i think i saw that as an option mm -hmm. and the oidc middleware so OIDC middleware is is similar to like Octa React, Octa View, where it is a uh, opinionated implementation. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure what flow it it uses, but it it uses uh passport uses an OI Open ID client under the hood and passport integration. Um, so see. you can just add it uh, as middleware directly onto your Express app, and the idea is that you get all of that all of that stuff for free. Um, the the JWT verifier would be used if you want to verify a token. So um, if you have a token on the client and you're sending it back to your server and you want to verify that the token hasn't been tampered with, um, et cetera, because uh, uh, JWTs, like ID tokens, are ultimately signed. If for whatever reason you need to verify that your your token hasn't been tampered or you want to ver verif further verification of the token, you would reach for the JWT verifier. But the JWT verifier is, is only ever made to um, run in a node context. That would be a server-only application. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, educating us all on the front end of the SDK world. Is there anything else that you would like developers to know as they're using AuthJS? One thing I do think that AuthJS does a poor job of is is there's not an easy linkage between the auth flow that you're reaching for and the methods that you would be um, utilizing in the SDK. Um, that's that's something that we're 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 trying to fix. I, I think I mentioned at the at the top that we're we're thinking about breaking apart AuthJS to make it a little bit more digestible. Um, I, I think it can be a little bit overwhelming of an of a library right now because it's made you know to to run everywhere and do everything. So there's so many methods in it and, you know, they're all named after authentication. So they all sound the same. So uh, it's, it can be difficult to determine which method you want to use and when. Um, and I think part of it, most of that is, is, is a documentation issue. I, I think we could definitely um, um, revamp the, the readmes a lot and link them more carefully to the OAuth spec. Um, the, the OAuth spec just kind of keeps moving. We need we need to keep our docs up to up to date, specifically the the README. But 
I, I think that's that's probably a big a big um, thing that we need to we need to address on our end. Um, so I, I don't know patience maybe, but uh, yeah, I I think that's something to to keep in mind if if you're trying to link your OAuth flow to methods in the SDK and and you're you're struggling to to link the two. I I don't think you're alone in that. Um, I, I myself, when I read the docs, sometimes go like, huh? And I have to go look into the code to figure things out. So you know, you're not alone. If you have any problems, though, make sure you let us know. You can add comments. You can file a GitHub issue. You can add a comment to the developer forums. And we'd love to hear about it and help make it a easier, better experience for you. Yeah. And thank you both for joining me today. And thank you to our listeners for sticking with us through this and learning with us. So go ahead and let us know in the comments what you'd like to hear about in future podcasts. Would you like us to go into more depth on the SDKs? Are there other Okta tools that you'd like us to track down an expert on? We would love to hear about what you would like to hear about. 